And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrennerCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Preneurcast. It is, in fact, episode 50. We are halfway to 100. Uh, I'm Dom Goucher, and he is Pete Williams. Very exciting news, mate. That's great. 50 episodes. Seems like just yesterday, doesn't it? It does. Almost to our one-year anniversary. Almost, almost. And we have big things for episode 52, folks. Big things. So uh, do keep listening and uh, watch out for that one. But uh, got big things this week as well. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Like every week. Well, hey, it's like, you know, it's like, how, have you been busy and things like that? It's always, yeah, of course we've been busy and of course we've got big things to talk about. Um, but but what, what have you been up to, mate? What have you been up to this week? Oh, lots of things. Lots of great things. Actually had uh, some really good conversations with uh, a couple of... Uh, new authors or, or authors of new books, uh, which is really cool, and was able to record those conversations. So very, very exciting. I'll uh, be putting them up on the blog shortly. One of them uh, was actually kind of very similar topics, which was uh, kind of uh, ironic and out of the blue. The, the first one, which will be going up on the blog very shortly, is um, an author of the book called Creating Innovators. Uh, and the subtitle of that is uh, The Making of Young People Who Will Change the World. And uh, Tony Wagner is the author of Harvard a Harvard University uh, lecturer, so it was uh, a little intimidating, but he was a very down-to-earth bloke. And we, we spoke about not only from a, a parenting perspective but and a school perspective, but also very much from a uh, an entrepreneur, business leader, owner type um, aspect of, of what you can do to you know ensure you have innovators in your team and in, in uh, and sort of help create those. And a really cool conversation about lots of different things and um, something I didn't actually know, which is. Uh, that P. Diddy, Sean Combs, also went to a Montessori school, as did, obviously, the founders of Google, which is um, quite highly documented, uh, the founder of Wikipedia, uh, and a few other bits and pieces as well. Of, um, some interesting people went to a Montessori school, so that's sort of a, you know interesting fact, but uh, it was a really good conversation about a whole bunch of different stuff, so that'll be up on the blog very shortly. So does, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very interested in that topic, and uh, it's it's kind of the the more practical sounds like a more practical version of outliers by um by malcolm gladwell and he talks about the origins of people but but tony seems to be talking about the reality of of actually encouraging it yeah yeah exactly right and and outliers definitely came up in the conversation funnily enough so it's very much a practical sort of um example uh, or, or practical book and he interviewed a whole bunch of people and there's a lot of really cool case studies which we touch on a, a couple of product managers at Google and and how their um, upbringing affected what they did in their life and, and things like that. So it's a, a really, really cool read and uh, the interview is a really good conversation. It's more of a conversation than an interview I think is a, a better word to use. Yeah, well, that, that's always the better way to do it though. Just one thing to pick up on there because you, you said in an offhand way, of course, the guys from Google went to Montessori schools, which is fine if everybody knows what a Montessori school is, but but just very quickly, could you just clarify that one for me? Oh, God. Um, yeah, look, a Montessori school, I'm probably not the best person to, to articulate this, but it's basically a, a different sort of curriculum for school and, and it goes all the way from kindergarten to uh, end of uh, you know high school or secondary school. Uh, and it's basically um, not structured. You know, the general learning environment is very much about retention in that when the lecturer or the teacher stands at the front of the class and just talks and the kids have to retain that information. That's very much the primary learning uh, modality that happens in schools. Whereas in the Montessori school, it's very much about exploration and creativity. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's in a uh, the mastermind group that I'm involved in and she her kids – uh, go to Montessori schools, and we were sort of chatting about it last night. And she um, mentioned that you know one day when her um, uh, child came home from school, uh, what did you do at, do at school today? I spent the whole day making football trading cards, and that was like literally his whole day at school in the middle of a random week, not like at the last day of school type activity. This was like a, an average day in the life of this student is to create trading cards around his local uh, you know favorite football club. Uh, and, you know, on the surface, most parents would be like, what a waste of a day. But if you really look into it, he had a rule to say that every card had to, you know, look the same, be the same size, 
had to have 50% drawing, 50% writing. And that was basically the, the, the as restricted as it was. And he spent you know time obviously doing some research and getting the player's stats and, and getting his handwriting nice and neat and, and doing the layout and the design. And if you think about it, that's how most things happen in the real world. You know, that's, you, you sort of you know get a, a limited structure and you've got to be creative around that. Uh, and learn a lot of skills as he, as he did that, um, but it was very it's, it's very unrestricted. And um, you know, I, if you've read uh, In the Plex, which or, or listened to the audio book of In the Plex, which I've done, you know, from Audible dot com, which is a, a great sponsor of the show, um, that they talk about, you know, they um, Larry and Sergey, Sergey or Sergi, Sergey, I think it is, who, who founded Google, uh, are very very proud of their Montessori upbringing and, and say that's a big reason that Google was a success it is and is a big driver of a lot of the culture at Google, which is obviously the, the, the pinup uh, boy of companies at the moment. So I think there's a lot of um, power, logic um, in the Montessori sort of school, um, you know, uh, style. And uh, it's, you know, something that Fleur and I have been discussing, you know, <laughs> Not, not, even, not having kids or anything like that at the moment, but obviously just getting married and, you know, coming up in conversation, you know, there's no, there's no question in my mind that, that you know, our kids um, will be Montessori educated, at least through primary school, if not high school as well. It's, it's a really cool thing. I mean, I do, I, I asked you the question. I do know the answer or some of the answers because, again, I, I know people, quite a couple of people. Surprisingly, when you talk to people and you mention it, suddenly they go, oh, yeah, you know, my kids or my, you know, somebody in my family or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of it is based around that, that, kind of taking responsibility for their own learning and things like that it's, it builds it and I, i'm sure in tony's book i'm going to go first of all i'm going to go listen to that interview and then and then i'm going to go get that book because I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a big factor of what tony talks about in the book uh, about nurturing these these ideas you know i mean i have to say i've wished in a number of times when i've worked in the past with people i've wished that i'd had adults that could follow a simple set of rules and guidelines <laughs> and stay within them so you know if people are helping kids to do that at school i'm, I'm more for it yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah i think the, the, the question the two questions that i asked last night uh well the one question i asked and the one statement of advice that i was given last night when i was uh, speaking to the, the friend of mine is that like how are the kids outside of the school when they actually are interacting and integrating in general society on, on the weekends in their sporting clubs or with cousins of the same age who aren't doing that traditional schooling. Uh, and, the, you know, because my concern was are they going to be isolated or, you know, feel a bit intimidated or something like that and, and the complete contrary, you know, in terms of they, they feel a lot more self-confident and all that sort of stuff, which um, which is a good peace of mind that sort of um, was a bit of a worry for me. And the advice was obviously if you're expecting your child to go in and, you know, in Australia our... Um, high school equivalency test or, you know, uh, is it what's called uh, the VCE, the Victorian Certificate of Education, and, you know, it's a ranking out of 100 and, you know, if you the, the, the top kids get 99 and, and it's a percentage base, only 1% of the, you know, graduating class uh, statewide can can get a, uh, a score of 99, you know, in the top 1%. Um, so if you're expecting your kid to get a score in that, you know, above 90, um, it's not going to happen because obviously the what's required to know and understand and learn to achieve that in the exams uh, is not what's taught at a Montessori school. So it's definitely a, uh, a different sort of focus when it comes to uh, the traditional black and white measurement that you'd have of a traditional school system. So uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So you know, completely ir- irrelevant to the preneur cast, but at the same time, so relevant. Exactly. To exactly. I, I have to say, it's, it might have sounded like a little bit off off topic, but I do think that. And I, I, I I've, as soon as you mentioned that you're going to talk to Tony, I became quite fascinated by that topic because I started thinking about it in outliers. You know, how do people get where they are? Why are, for example, why are you different to me? You know, you are almost literally ten years younger than me depressingly i have to admit this <laughs> and and yet your business you know your business acumen your knowledge of business and the, the businesses that you have are far more developed than mine and there's there'll be things in your background uh, so maybe you know maybe we can come back when everybody's had a bit of time to look at that and and go through that kind of thing maybe we can talk about this because it, it's a little bit esoteric but i think it's quite an interesting topic to talk about about being an entrepreneur and how what what makes a good entrepreneur and where you, where they come from? Uh, and yeah, I, I'm absolutely. Gonna, I'm going to got a load of questions for you on that. But to, <laughs> well, to, go on. 
I was going to say, in, in terms of that, you know, obviously mentioned uh, Audible, which is, you know, a, a sponsor of the show. And uh, speaking to Tony, there is a, an audio version planned, but it's, it's not going to be released um, when the book comes out. The book's out uh, April, I think, 17th, um, 2012, for those who are listening in the future to the back catalogue. Um, and if it's, you know, your first time listener, welcome to the show. Welcome. Um, go back to the back catalogue. There's definitely some relevant episodes. But, um, you know, two great books that I'd suggest people pick up on, on Audible, which is the link to sign up for the free download. Dom is... Audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast. That'll be in the show notes as well. I was like, we rehearsed that. Um, so audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast where you can get uh, a free trial for Audible, which is a, an amazing library of audio books. But, but two good books when it's sort of comes to finding out the the history of um great companies and great people is you know the steve jobs autobiography obviously uh and also in the plex which is a, a great book about how google grew from from the tumble beginnings to to the mega mega company that is today and a lot of it talks about um the the two founders uh history and prior to google and their upbringing and how that's shaped the, the culture of google so they're, they're two really good books that um, I'd suggest people listen to very, very um, engaging audio books. Some can be very, very bland, but these are two very engaging audio books that you know link into the topic where, where we sort of touched on as an introduction to the podcast. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, pop over audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast. You'll get a free trial. And uh, there's still uh, there's a token on there if you go through that uh, link to get a free download on the, on the service. So uh, choose one of those books. I do, rec- I do recommend the Steve Jobs one and Indiplex, like you. Uh, we've listened to that. But uh, let's uh, – I, I, I thank you for getting us almost back on topic there for the uh, – <laughs> without me having to drag you back. But it was me that led you off it. So, hey, you know, mea culpa. Um, so uh, this week's topic, last week was, was my own personal rant and soapbox, and I hope people have recovered from that. Uh, <laughs> um, this, week, this week you've got one, haven't you? Well, I just wanted to talk uh, and, and have a, a conversation, I guess, about the topic of, of marketing myths. And I think there's so many people out there, you know, every second person's a, a, a social media expert or um, information marketer and and things like that, which I was uh, starting to grind on me a little bit. But, you know, again, that's not the soapbox for this episode. It can be later in the, in the series or the show. But, um, you know, everyone's sort of screaming certain must-dos and, and certain marketing doctrine and, and you know, non-negotiables, if you will. And I just think a lot of that is, is misguided without, again, the word that I seem to love on this show so much is a frame and context. Um, you know, the, the one I, I mentioned at the end of last week's show, which is I think a great place to start, is that every business needs a website. You know, you hear that so much being screamed and yelled and, you know, every man and their dog, you know, even your taxi driver when you mention that you're a business owner, do you have a website? You, know, you have to have a website. And I really think that is a very misguided uh, approach to, to business and marketing advice. I, I can't agree more. I, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> interestingly, in, in where, I, where I'm living right now, in a, a small fishing village in coastal Spain, that if I was to actually, I've got the inverse situation. Uh, where the internet isn't prevalent. I don't have everybody around me as a social media expert. I I do have a few of them whose apparently their cousin is, but there you go. Um, But here, the concept of having a website is pretty alien. But out in normal, normal normal is a bad word, but out in everyday culture, you know, the, the circles that we operate in, absolutely. First thing is, first thing is, first question, have you got a website? You need a website. You must have a website. But it's not true, is it? No, I don't, I don't think it is. I think for a lot of businesses, it does make sense. But there's plenty of companies and businesses out there which, you know, all the website can ever be is just a glorified brochure to make the wife at the country club feel special when they show the really pretty flash designed website. And, you know, if you need to invest in that to, to, to keep the wife happy and the, the wife at bay so she's not sort of embarrassed by the ugly direct response marketing that you're doing that actually works when she talks about your business at the country <laughs> club, then so be it. Invest that money. Consider that an investment in peace and quiet and support. Um, so there's justification there to have a, a very flash driven brochure based website. But for most companies, 
you know, it comes back to the preneur hierarchy episode that we uh, touched on uh, and, and continue to bring up in the show is that you think about it, where you, you need to market your business primarily to start with and in most cases um, plenty of businesses that I've dealt with and consulted with and spoken to don't even have the resources or the need to really maximize the first level of the hierarchy, uh, which is fundamentally for when it comes to lead generation, is people out there searching for a solution to the problem that you solve. Now, a lot of businesses these days, as we've spoken about, their marketplace and their target market, they go to Google when they're trying to search for a solution to a problem they have. So they go to Google and they're looking in the search results. And in, in, if that's your market, then you absolutely have to have a website. You need to be looking at doing AdWords and SEO um, beyond just having a website. Obviously, you need to be actually generating the marketing activity you need to, to, to get your website in front of those eyeballs. And in that circumstance, having a website is important. But there's plenty of businesses where that's just not relevant because their customers and their prospects and their targets aren't going to Google to search for the solution. In some instances, Yellow Pages still works extremely well. If you're targeting a certain age demographic who aren't au fait with Google and iPads and, and your smartphones and all that sort of stuff, that demographic is still going to the Yellow Pages. So if you're dealing with that sort of housewife, elderly sort of marketplace, Yellow Pages is still worth a consideration. You shouldn't just throw that away. Um, if you're a restaurant, for example, you know, having actual your own personal website is probably one of the last things I would have as part of my digital marketing campaign setup checklist. I'd be looking at things like making sure you have all your menus and your details on things like Urban Spoon and you know Yelp and all these online platforms that have a better ranking engine than you'll ever have for your own business and your own sort of niche, you know, steakhouse in Coburg. You know, these Yelps and the uh, Urban Spoons and all this sort of stuff, um, you know, the, the meal um, type, you know, comparison shopping sites or things like that are going to be better engines and better time well spent cultivating an audience and maximizing your listing there. Google Maps, again, is a, a place you'd, I would put beyond putting up your own website because, you know, that's where people are going to go more so than actually searching for your own individual name and trying to rank for steak restaurant in San Francisco it's going to be near impossible because if you look at the first couple of pages of the results, in most instances, they're flooded by these, um, well, I'm trying to think, I can't think of the word, but the... The, Re the re recommendation sites. There you go. That, that's, that's probably a good example. So it's, it's horses for courses and it's, you know, really thinking through and, and doing that triage stuff that we've spoken about again on the show is saying, well, hang on, is it the best place to start? And, and not listening to everyone saying you have to have a website and then suddenly turning around and getting a website because that's what people are saying to you. You have to understand the justification of why you need that website. You need to understand the why first before you actually do anything. Absolutely. And, and to, to build on that, because and, and something so I, I finally found a great in what you were saying I finally found a great analogy for a problem that I see so many times. You and I both do consulting work. We both work together with our mastermind group, and we work independently consulting with people for online business and online promotion. Um, and the, one of the most common things that both you and I see is that that it's a thing I call a box ticker. And that is somebody who's been told to do something, so they go away and do it and tick a box. Yep. And and the analogy that I have for the problem that I see, the most common problem that you and I both see is the yellow pages ad. If you, <laughs> if, if you go through the, the triage, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but if you go through the triage and you, you go to come to the conclusion that for your marketplace, for the people you want to reach, et cetera, et cetera, that you're – you need a website or you want to build a website as, a, as an additional resource for your marketing, evaluate it against the following. If you were putting a Yellow Pages ad in, if you were paying to have a Yellow Pages ad, which isn't that expensive, and in most cases it's not even as expensive as having a website built, but if you were doing that, would you, well, what would you put in your Yellow Pages ad? Would you, for example say where you were if you were a bricks and mortar business uh, would you for example 
put your phone number in big letters if you wanted a phone call? Or would you put some other call to action or, or direct response item in that advert? And the answer is yes, you would. You'd put the name of your company, you'd put what you did, or in some way classify, make sure you were classified or, or, or categorized in the right place. And you would absolutely put some method of contact. You absolutely would not take out even a tiny one line ad in the yellow pages without putting your phone number on it, right? Absolutely. So why on earth do people build websites where they want people to call them and the phone number isn't visible? Folks, really, seriously, you know? And, and this is, this is the, the corollary to what we're talking about. N not everybody needs a website. And those examples you gave, a Google Places listing is free and in most cases will outrank a website. It will appear in a big box with a map on it, with a big pin on it, saying, hey, I'm here. And I've had far more success with Google Places listings for local businesses than I have for websites because you're right. Things like Urban Spoon for, for restaurant listings or the even Yellow Pages. Yellow Pages are, are quite good at ranking for local, ter local search terms around the world. And, and if you're a one-man band or a small bricks and mortar business and you're in a local environment and you want to rank in the search engines, that's a lot of work to even get on that front page. Whereas a free Google Places listing, if it's done right – will rank you. Um, but whatever it is that ranks or however people find that thing that it is, make sure it does the job. You know, it's not just about making sure that you've picked the right vehicle or the right marketing tool, but that it actually does the job. And this is one of the things that, you know, that we talk about quite a lot it is, is not just picking the right thing, but using it well as well. Because a well-placed Google Places or Google Maps listing as I said, is far more of, can can be far more effective than a three thousand dollar website. Yeah, exactly right. So it's that understanding of the why, and then figuring out once you know the why, is it the best way to get that outcome? You know, is it the best way to get the why? Is what that was originally suggested. You know, someone says get a website. You understand why? Well, it's so you can get online and get traffic from online sources. Okay, you understand that's the outcome of why they suggested that. Now, is that realistically having the knowledge from listening to the Preneurcast on a regular basis and reading the newsletters and all that sort of stuff? Is that the best actual path to market to get that outcome? Because in so many instances, it's actually not really. Um, and people are trying to do the right thing by giving you advice, uh, and it's going to be generic advice because. In most cases on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube videos and all that sort of stuff, they have to be generic because when it comes to technical advice, they can't be specific. It's impossible to be specific to, for their entire audience when they're trying to give tactical advice. And that's why I guess we've taken a bit more of a, a strategery. That is a word. I'm going to make it a word. <laughs> a more of a strategery type play with the printer cast. It's sort of trying to give you that um, tactical stuff, but giving the tactical stuff and the tools to actually um, ensure that the tactics are implemented in the right context and the right frame is what it's all about. That's a, it's, it's, it is a really important point. Yeah, the, the actual implementation of something is so specific to you and your business and your situation that the, the best thing you can do is start with the strategy and make sure the strategy is solid. Because you can find a an outsourcer or a consultant to give you that specifics as long as you feed the right information in. And, on, and really, you are the one that knows that and can find it out. So strategy is where we will always come back to, I, I, yeah. I would say. Because it's the best thing we, as generalists who don't know you specifically, can give you in a podcast. Yeah, and that's why we have the mastermind groups of people who want to sort of take that next step and get a bit more granular and a bit more one-on-one -on -one tactical, we have those, you know, opportunities out there. But, you know, another, you know, great marketing myth is, you know, every sale's a good sale. Ooh. You know, so many people sort of, you know, get blindsided or have the, you know, the blinkers on if you're looking at the trotting um, type analogy. As soon as they see a purchase order in front of them, they start thinking all they see is the dollars. The, the, the ink turns green. Almost, if you're in America, and you get that greenback sort of, a, uh, you know, goggles on, and you know, for a lot of businesses, particularly when you're starting out, it's it, it is obvious, and it makes it does make sense that any sales are good sale when you're starting out, um, because you know any revenue 
helps you get you closer to, to, to the goal of keeping the doors open next week. And, and completely understand that. But at some point, I think, you know, businesses have to make that conscious decision to start slowly uh, migrating from any sales of good sale to only a sale that meets my criteria is a good sale. And it, it can't, it has to be a gradual thing. You have to start, you know, there's a, a, a great, um, you know, strategy uh, piece of advice out there, which is every year you should increase your prices by 5% or increase your uh, target market up by f- or move your target market up by 5% and fire your bottom 5% clients every year, just continually lifting the bar, that, that bottom rung people have to jump over. You know, if you're a, uh, a consultant in a certain sort of space and you say the minimum uh, investment is five grand, or if you know you're you're, you're doing something where they have to, you're you're supporting or controlling that investment, you know you have to spend five grand a month on this service before I'm going to take you on as a client. Uh, and then every every year you go next year it's six thousand, and the year after that it's seven thousand. Because if you really analyse your business, for most people, eighty percent of the problems come from twenty percent of the clients, and generally it's that bottom twenty percent. You know everyone knows the eighty twenty rule, and it, it is true, but in most cases, and there's obviously exceptions, and this is a generalization, I know, but for most businesses, it's the bottom 20% of clients that cause the 80% of problems because they are they're just they're stretching themselves to use your service in most examples. So they want to get every little last you know piece of blood from the stone because they're you know struggling themselves to be able to use your service. If they're a profitable business, if they're a profitable client, if they're a wealthy client. You know they're going to be spending the they're going to be that higher end client who's going to spend more money and 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 understand uh, what's what's expected more and, and not sort of trying to get blood from a stone. So you know not every sale is a good sale and and, and it, that has to change as your business grows. Yeah, and the example you gave of of the, the the top end and the bottom end clients, I think, is an easier one in a way to see because it's a great example from the four hour work week. Tim Ferriss talks about exactly that situation where he basically fired. I think he actually fired eighty percent of his clients um, <laughs> to to get the top twenty percent that were paying him the eighty percent of his profits. You know, the the eighty twenty rule was there again. Uh, and, and because his C-class clients or whatever, however you want to label these people, were, were draining his resources and were taking support time and personal interactions from him, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and it's not always about how much they pay. It's a, sometimes it's about how easy it is to deal with them. So it's easier looking at it from a client point of view, but it maps, it maps directly to, any, to, to just anything. Any sale is not a good sale. Sometimes you might be, if you're, again, a bricks and mortar and you're selling product, you, you might you, you might go all Walmart on it, and you might want to 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 sell sell a lot of product with a small margin. But that might not be the good thing. You know, there's a lot of infrastructure issues with doing that. It, Walmart can do it because they're massive. But you know, maybe you want to think, look at your product line and think, well, there are some products that I make fifty percent profit on. Why don't I try and sell more of those? For example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, I, you, you're absolutely right. So, I, 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 yeah. So, but any sales are good sales. One of the, I think one of the oldest marketing myths. It's not a really, it's not even a recent one, is it? It's, well, it's pretty old. But there's 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 lots of really new ones that you talked about. You know, you, you alluded to earlier. So, uh, come on, let's go all high tech on the world. What else have we got that's a, that's that's being bandied oh, around? I, I was actually going to go very uh, analog. Oh, I was going to go high tech. Go on then. Go I on. was going to talk about and. Knowing me, I, 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 I say this a lot, so there's a fair chance I probably said it on one of the early episodes of the show, but just because your big competitor is doing something doesn't mean you should do it as well. Ooh. And I see so many businesses who see a competitor implement some sort of marketing strategy or marketing campaign and people start thinking, that's why I should do it. Um, you know, and you can you can be very very you know silly with this and saying just because your competitor puts an A-frame out the front of their store doesn't mean you should do that, and, and I, that's a very sort of silly example. But that's how serious I am with this. You know, there's a, a, a example that I, I talk about in my, in my first book, which is the 
um, 25 words or less questions, which I, I may have used this example in another way on the show, but it, it's a serious point in that, you know, so many companies out there use the 25 words or less contests um, to sort of, you know, as an excuse for the um, response mechanism for that contest. You know, you see plenty of people saying, you know, just SMS or text in the barcode or, you know, fill out your name and address to actually, um, you know, enter this contest and you win a car or a free pack of minties or whatever it might be. But so many companies are, are also, as part of this response mechanism, mechanism, sorry, requiring people to actually do a 25 words or less type entry. You know, sort of like in 25 words or less, tell us blah, blah, blah. Because everyone's sort of seen those, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the science behind those 25 words or less contests, it comes back to Cialdini's influence factor of commitment and consistency. If you can get someone to not only mentally think of this, but then take the physical act of making it an out-of-body experience by writing it down along the lines of 25 words or less, why I love Safeway supermarkets. 25 words or less, why I really enjoy drinking Coca-Cola. And that way, when you're actually physically thinking it and then physically writing it out, it's really that commitment. You made that verbal commitment, that external commitment to the world of why I like Coca-Cola. So next time you actually go to a supermarket, you actually buy Coke because you will remember why you verbalized or wrote why you like Coca-Cola. And that's the science behind it. But you see so many businesses starting when they want to run a contest go, oh, yeah, look, I'm going to run a 25 words or less contest as the response mechanism because Joe Blow did it, this other company did it, our competitor did it, whoever did it, Google did it, whatever it might be. And they do the most obscure question with no benefit at all. You know, they ask a question, I remember uh, one, and the example I use in my book, uh, and in a lot of places, is an example of where uh, Angus and Robertson Bookstore, which was a bricks and mortar bookstore chain here in Australia, ran a contest um, where you could win a signed autographed cricket bat by Shane Warne, who was a uh, uh, one of the, the best cricket players ever. And the question was, what do you love about Shane Warne in 25 words or less? And to me, it was like, well, hang on, Angus and Robertson... That is not helping your brand on any level whatsoever. And if you read the terms and conditions, it was a game of chance anyway. They weren't actually reading those responses to determine who should win the bat. It was just going to be a random chance. And they just used that as a response mechanism. And if you look at that and break it down, there's two really big issues with that. One is that anytime you ask for more than a name and an email address it reduces response rate. That's just yeah. a direct response rule. That was that was the immediate thing in my head. As soon as you said that, I was like, but that's a barrier. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as you do a 25 words or less um, requirement as part of the response mechanism, it's going to reduce your response rate anyway. That's just a given. And in a lot of circumstances, that's fine. If you're trying to actually you know, get a targeted group of people and reinforce the commitment and consistency methodology. But they didn't do that in, the, in that. In their 25 words or less contest, there was no commitment and consistency for the brand who were putting up the money for the contest. They were doing commitment and consistency of why they loved a sports hero. There's no value in that for anybody. So there was two big downsides that these guys did when they implemented this. And I guarantee you, it was a middle-level marketing manager who was given the, the role to do the contest and thought, hey, I've seen 25 words or less contests run by Reader's Digest by you know, Coca-Cola, by Ford Motor Company, by whoever it might be, and we'll just do the same thing, but didn't think through the science behind it and the why behind it. You know, Ford Motor Company does these quite regularly, and a lot of um, car manufacturers do, and it's all about what do you love about driving a Ford? What is it that you know, do you love about the particular car? And, and people, what do you love about using Canon photo, f- photography cameras, whatever it might be? Because it gets you to start thinking that commitment and consistency of why you do it. And even if someone actually, this is a sad and negative side about the Cialdini factors. Even if someone doesn't actually love a Canon camera right now, but wants to enter the contest to win one, they will start making up in their own mind what they think is a good enough reason of why they should love Canon. And they'll write that down. And unfortunately, that actually still affects the person on a subconscious level. So when they go to buy their next camera in six months or two years' time, they'll remember, only minutely, but to a certain extent, why they love Canon. And that will play in their decision-making process. And it's a 
uh, it, that's the power, be it positive or negative, depending how you want to look at it. That's the power of the influence factors that Cialdini talks about in his book. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually, I know people, you know, in the past have done, who've gone, gone in for those, you know, when I was younger and, and it was a very popular thing uh, at one point in the UK for people to do that. And I remember actually people scouring the marketing material for the product to find a feature that they could then key off of to write those 25 words. So it's, as you say, the child anything is working, they're now, they're now actually investigating a product that they previously knew not so much about. They now know more about it. So they're more committed to that product. But throughout what you were saying, I, 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 all I could think was box ticking. It's box ticking again. It's people looking at somebody else doing something, going and making a facsimile, and I, I use facsimile or copy because it's their 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 inter, in, interpretation of what they're seeing without the frame and the context. Yeah, absolutely. But, That's exactly what it is. They're not so so. In the case of the twenty five words or less, I, to be honest with you, before I before I knew you. I, I didn't know that's what the 25 words or less was actually doing. I was unaware, well, before I knew you, before I read the Cialdini book, you know. You are, let, let, let's be honest about this. You were unaware about a lot of things before you met me, but even, even beyond business. <laughs> Why, thank you, sir. <laughs> right back at ya. <laughs> Um, seriously, the, the Cialdini book is, was, was written originally for those reasons. It was to educate people, to tell them why these things have been done. But, but this box ticking, this go, is what we're it's really marketing myths is what we're talking about. We're talking about box ticking. We're talking about doing something because somebody else did it or because you've been told to do it without understanding the true frame and context of it without understanding the strategy of it and therefore not being able to implement it properly for your business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so, so whether it's a modern day thing, like everybody needs a website, uh, or, or any sale is a good sale, or as you say, the 25 words or less, you know, run a competition, you know, as you say, that, that, that cricket example was great. You know, it's like I benefited the cricket guy. <laughs> exactly right. He was, you know, if, if anyone knows the Shane One story, he was doing extremely well himself and didn't need people to, to reinforce why they liked him, hmm. especially to the ladies. But the people that did it obviously didn't understand what the whole purpose of the contest was for, missed the point, and probably reduced, their, reduced what their real goal was. If their real goal was to either market themselves or to get a list of people, to get a mailing list or whatever, by putting that extra step in that, that was giving them no value then they're actually putting a barrier. You know, in the modern day technology, you know, in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the equivalent of that was the splash screen on the website. You know, <laughs> oh, he's got a splash screen. It's great. Look, it moves. It's got animation. It's got a spinning globe. His logo zooms in from the sides. Yeah, okay. I can't tell you how many times I clicked off those websites. Like, I don't want to see this. I've seen it. I saw it. This, I saw it this morning. I've come back to your website. I'm seeing it again. It's a barrier to entry. If your goal is to show me what a great animator you are, great. Stick a splash screen on your website. But unless you're selling animation services, get it off. You know, let me get to the thing that is actually going to give your business a benefit. And that's mm. it's just these are all examples of the same thing, really, aren't they? I, absolutely. I think the, the lesson to take away from all of this is just if you are at a a seminar. Or listen to a podcast like this, or reading a book is when they tell you to do something with conviction. Just take a moment and go. Not a problem at all. There's got to be value in here on some level. But where does that apply to my business? And use something like the preneur hierarchy, or the seven levers, or even the marketing symphony that we spoke about in one of our very first shows here on Preneurcast, and just use that as the filter to think. Hang on. How is it that I best get the most value out of doing this website, out of doing this toll-free phone number, out of doing this direct mail piece, out of doing the A-frame at the front of my store, whatever it might be. When anyone sort of gives you some marketing advice, just think about the why behind it and the context and go, okay, hang on, how can I get the best value out of this? Because you know there is some truth in it. If it's, if it's a marketing 
truth or a marketing statement said with conviction, there's got to be some weight behind it. But then you just got to work out how and where does that potentially apply to your business? Where in the actual implementation um, orders or order list or checklist does it fit? Because it might not be number one. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I mean, we, we did a whole show on marketing filters. I'll pop a link in the show notes to it. Um, about looking at whatever you're looking at through uh, uh, through through a framework that, that gives you an idea of what it is you're trying to achieve, and then, and, and my example is is I'll come back to websites as an example of this. Make sure that whatever, you, however you implement, if you decide it's going to benefit you within that framework or within whatever your goal is, you know whatever the strategy is that you're after. If that tactic is going to work, then make sure that you do. The, the the most important things make sure they're done so with the example of the website literally i have seen i've had clients and i have seen more examples than this than, than i care to mention not just with clients but out there in the you know in the open open marketplace where they've got say a 20 or 30 page website or they've got uh, some some feature of their website they've spent money on this website you know, they've, they've spent money on it for whatever reason. And the two classic examples I have are they've got a massive website, but their phone number isn't visible or is buried. And they actually, their goal of their company, their sales goal was to get phone calls. So that website could actually be replaced with a single screen with a big phone number on it and a logo and saying, we do this. Yes, you found us. Ring us now. And they'd get more, yeah. literally, they'd get more results. And the other example, which is far, far, far worse, was a large uh, unnamed company <clears throat> uh, who had a new website. Lovely, brilliant, fantastic, really good. Actually, awesome bit of interactive media, really good. Their goal, uh, to get people who were searching for a particular keyword on Google to see this website. They spent a lot of money on this website. What they hadn't done is make sure that Google had seen it. <laughs> or Flash, no index, no follow. It wasn't – no, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm not – and, and the, by the way, everything that Peter said, really technical stuff, actually, none of that was relevant. It literally – it wasn't it, – it, Google couldn't read the website, and those are all reasons that Pete just mentioned why Google can't read your website – which is you know a more technical thing that we you know when you get down to the low level of it at the top of the top of the top level in order for somebody to type something into google and for your website to appear in google google must first actually f see it it must be aware of it it's something that a lot of people don't know about it's a bit technical but it, it's a very important step in the process which most people are unaware of and this particular website literally had never been seen by Google. So there was literally no words whatsoever. You couldn't even type the actual full web address into Google and get a result. <laughs> so make sure that yeah. whatever tactic you're implementing, you you get the basics. <laughs> so, so hang on, hang on. So you're telling me they listened to that taxi driver, took the advice, and have a website? Yeah. So, so, so technically they did the right thing. They They... They have a website. They they they, 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 the they ticked the, the box. They, they ticked the box. box. The, the taxi driver says get a website, so they got a website. But the important tactical element for them, which was Google listing, forget search engine stuff. Forget all that complicated stuff that other people are trying to teach you and sell you through various means. I mean, seriously, this is the most fundamental part of it, and they missed it. Just like the business that has a website and Google has seen it, and people do visit it. But their phone number isn't visible. It doesn't matter what level of technology or technical whateverness, down at the bottom of it, there's always going to be something that is core to your goal. Yeah? You, when, you, when, you, when we do the seven levers, you know, when we look at a business, we use the seven levers for, for our, our strategy, our triage, we assess our business against our seven levers at, of business and we look down and we look at the traffic and we look at the opt-ins and the conversions and we look at each level. And at each level, we want something to happen. And the first thing that we say, and, you know, in our mastermind group, we walk people through it and we say, okay, what is traffic? What, what, is, what, what is traffic to this business? Is it somebody walking through the door? Is it, uh, you know, is it a human being walking past? Is it a phone call? Is it a website visit? What is traffic to you? 
And then the next thing is, what is an opt-in? And literally, we see this all the time, that businesses just are, are so busy ticking boxes that they, and listening to these marketing myths or listening to the taxi driver or whatever you want to call it, we see this, and they're so busy doing it and, and feel the great level of achievement because it, it looks pretty or it spins or whatever it might be, but they miss minor details like, their actual goal was get a phone call and the phone number isn't the biggest thing on the page or there isn't a call to action telling people to actually use the phone number and what for and so on. And I guess that's what we're, what we're about here really, isn't it? That's exactly right. That's what it's all about. So, um, we're, we're about, we're about on time on that one, mate, but I, 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 I think that was a really important thing to go through. I think that, as you say, these things are, are are out there. These myths are out there. People talk to people and people go to conferences and they see the guy at the front and he's a great speaker and he's really animated and he's got this great thing and he's got great evidence that it works and proof and case studies. Or you can read a website, there's testimonials. But I think I think listening, going back and, and looking at that marketing filters, listening to the marketing filters show will probably help people if they haven't already. Because if you don't filter what you're listening to, you just go along and you tick a box and say, yeah, okay, somebody said I need a website, I've got a website. You're probably going to be disappointed. Would not agree more, my friend. And that's it. You just, it's all about just thinking through things before you do it, and it's don't taking, you know, if if as your mother said, if your best friend jumps off the bridge, would you would you follow him? Uh, no, you wouldn't. You think it through first. That's what people don't often do in, in their business and their marketing. True. Cool. I, well, I think I think for that particular uh, rant and soapbox, I think we're uh, we're well and truly wrapped up. Um, at the beginning, you talked about Audible, the uh, audio book service uh, that is a sponsor of the show. Um, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm in a way these people, the, the the companies that sponsor us, they do they 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 do sponsor us. But really, what it is, it's about services that we recommend and that our listeners are benefiting from. So I think I'm going to kind of avoid the word sponsor and the big official thing from now on. Um, and, and really, because we do use them, I think, you know, Pete's already already talked about this, that, that he's listened to a couple of things on Audible in the last couple of weeks that have really been useful and interesting. Um, and I think if we just talk about them, you know, I, we both use the service. So rather than say, oh, no message from our sponsors, you know, it's like, we're going to try and give you something useful, something to go and look at, some reason to go look at them. So, Pete, you know you're a big, uh, you you are a great big fan of the Read It For Me service, the uh, book review service that we use. Is there something yeah, this week that you've got? Yeah, well, well, something that um, that the, the guys over there at, at Read It For Me have started to do beyond the book reviews, um, just like we mentioned last week about Audible. Beyond books, they actually have lectures and, and seminar recordings and stuff like that as part of their, their library that's available. Uh, Read It For Me are expanding their, their catalogue, so to speak, and including a, uh, a new series of interviews they've called the How To Series. And what they're doing is they're interviewing authors uh, about, uh, about particular topics of their book, and it's very much a, uh, a structured um, conversation or, or interview. Uh, it's almost almost like a lecture, really, where they actually, you know, the, the outcome they're trying to achieve is the three things to, whatever it might be. So if someone's written a book on publicity, what are the three key tips to publicity? Or if it's on productivity, what are the three key tips to, to, to that? And uh, they're, they're beyond the, the reviews. So you actually are getting some additional value as being a member of Read It For Me for the next, uh, um, you know, two months, two weeks, two years, however long you're going to be a member for. And um, it's really cool. There's some really great interviews in there and they're, they're breaking them down in the same way that they break down the books through the, the Lima method. So there's the the learn element, which is obviously the, the interview and the conversation. And then there's like the experience and the memorization side of things. So they do the idea codes and they do the whole graphics and all that sort of stuff that they do in a book review they're doing for these interviews, which is really, really cool. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, um, you know, there's, it's, it's worth signing up. Um, you know, you get a, a 10% discount if you want to stick around and, and be a paid up member, but you can go in there and just, just, just test it out. Um, for, for, for being a preneur cast listener and the, the domain for that uh, i'm going to handle back to you again dom is That's right. it's uh, we have a special link for you to follow it'll be in the show notes it's read it for dot me forward slash preneur cast and uh you know that's uh, check that out and um and, and have a look around read it for me if you've 
uh, you know, considered it before, this might be a, a good reason to, to jump back in and, and have a look around because of the, the audio interviews there. There's some really cool conversations that they've uh, been putting into the library. So uh, check it out. Cool, cool. So, so each week, instead of having the official sponsor thing, we're going to try and do this. We're going to try and tell you something that we found useful on these services because uh, yeah, listening to sponsorship messages can be a bit annoying. So we're going to try and make it, put it back to being the useful content uh, that, that our listeners really appreciate um, and just put our own particular spin on that content, um, which I think is more in keeping with what we're trying to do with the show. So to wrap up, uh, our action for the week, Pete, I think is just uh, be conscious of um, marketing myths out there. When you sort of hear something that's been said with a lot of uh, conviction, just uh, just question it really quickly and just think about how does that you know apply to your business. And, and and don't think of it in a generic sense. You know, don't sort of start just pondering. Oh, you know, will it fit with me? Have some sort of structured filter that you can turn to that's reliable. That's a system that you can continually uh, use as a reference point when you hear these uh, things that sound like marketing myths. Yeah, and and the 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 great one to to use is is to start with a strategy uh, for your business, which can be anchored around our framework of the seven levers or or the printer hierarchy, um, and just just make sure that what you're what you're thinking of implementing does achieve a goal that you've identified for your business, and then make sure that you implement it that, so that it can achieve that goal. You know, don't miss out those little details like the phone number. <laughs> True. What do, you, what do you want to do next week, Pete? Well, next week, I, I want to, uh, you know, pick your brain a bit as well. You know, you've uh, got some experience around the uh, the video and media uh, side of marketing, and I, I think it's worth exploiting that. And I think it's worth us uh, having a bit of chat about, you know, video marketing and, and, you know, it's a big medium online. And I think there's plenty of stuff that we can talk about in terms of how easy it actually is uh, and how unscary it needs to be. And more importantly, how cost effective video can be these days. And uh, I think we should have a topic around that because a lot of business people, whether they're information marketers or, or real world bricks and mortar retailers or even e-commerce providers who have uh, e-commerce sites selling real products to real people around the world, there's definitely an application for each of those that fits when it comes to video marketing. So I'd love to uh, you know, have a discussion around that with you, mate. Cool, cool. I, I, I have a feeling that some more marketing myths might be busted in that episode too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll speak next week and we'll, uh, we'll you know, put in a little myth, myth, myth busters outfits and we'll, uh, we'll talk about marketing using video. So are you going to be the guy with the silly moustache or has it got to be me? I, I can grow a moustache. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody for listening this week. Uh, been a great show. We, we, as always, have enjoyed it. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Do let us know in the comments on iTunes or over at preneurmedia.tv. Uh, pop us some feedback in the comments in either of those places or email us at Peter? Uh, preneurcast at preneurgroup.com. Ah, excellent. Okay, folks, um, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next week. Ciao. <laughs> been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via printercast at printergroup.com.